Hey, Paul, I'm excited to tell you that we are launching a Curbsiders Patreon. Have you heard about this? I, I did because I work with you, but tell me more about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, we want to be able to keep offering this great free content, and we're doing things like upgrading our website. We offer transcripts now for episodes, recording new seasons of our mini series, Teach and Addiction Medicine. The Digest is growing its staff. And, Paul, now we're on video. People can see us uh, as we're talking right here. It, what a treat for our listeners. That's right. So, with Cashlack admitting privileges, they're going to get. All episodes ad free. That's the whole back catalog plus future episodes. And twice monthly, there's going to be bonus episodes where me and you recap a show and answer some listener questions. So people should sign up today at patreon.com slash curbsiders. And uh, you get a whole lot of more of Paul, America's PCP. <laughs> The Curbsiders Addiction Medicine is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. The topics discussed should not be used to diagnose, treat, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the hosts and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity aside from possibly Cashlack Memorial Hospital. In short, we aren't responsible if you screw up. Please do your homework and let us know if we got something wrong. Welcome back to the Curbsiders Addiction Medicine, our mini series on substance use disorders. I'm Dr. Karen Lachan, and as I've alluded to, I'm joined by my amazing co host, Dr. Ira Krzyzewskaya, who you Rushed may have. Uh, amazing. Thank you for, <laughs> for prepping me extensively to say your last name properly, um, who many of you may be familiar with from the Curbsiders Teach, but we're thrilled to have you on for a couple of episodes with us this season. And on tonight's episode, we're going to be discussing return to use prevention counseling with psychologist Dr. Eve Laswell. But before we get started with that, Ira, will you remind everybody, what do we do on this show? You got it, Carolina. And it is a pleasure and an honor to join you on this recording. We are the addiction medicine podcast that uses expert interviews to demystify common addiction medicine topics, reduce stigma, and inspire listeners to be fierce advocates for all individuals who use substances. And a reminder that most episodes are available for free CME credit through VCU Health CE for all healthcare professionals at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. All you have to do is create an account. And by listening to this episode and completing the CME, you can use this towards the new DEA eight-hour requirement on substance use disorder education. So listen close. And as always, a very special thanks to the American College of Academic Addiction Medicine, also known as ACAM, who are partnered to help support the Curbsiders Addiction Medicine miniseries. ACAM is the proud home for academic addiction med faculty and trainees, and they are absolutely dedicated to training and supporting the next generation of academic addiction med leaders. So whether you're an addiction med physician looking for to prepare for the ABPM board exam or a physician in practice just looking to learn more about the field of addiction medicine, ACAM offers several self-study products that would help meet your needs. The professional practice bundle includes access to 86 self-assessment modules that provide CME as well as 46 didactic lecture recordings. ACAM's board prep bundle also offers access to the 46 didactic lecture recordings along with a nearly 200 item question bank and its addiction e-practice test. So to learn more about these and other product offerings, as well as a membership opportunities, be sure to visit acam.org. And as Carolyn mentioned, we have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Eve Laswell, PsyD. Dr. Laswell is a specialty-trained addiction psychologist and assistant clinical professor at the University of, San Di of California at San Diego. I just got so excited about the San Diego. <laughs> she provides substance use disorder and trauma treatment to patients in substance treatment and recovery program at UCSD, and she serves as faculty for the UCSD Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship. She also teaches first-year medical students in the UCSD School of Medicine. Dr. Laswell completed a fellowship in addiction psychology after earning her doctorate at Indiana State University. Clinical work is her passion, and she feels lucky every day that she gets to work with people working to change their lives. And Carolyn, should we tease um, our favorite pearls from this, from this episode? We should. It's hard to even come up with a couple because there were like 50 <laughs> that I want to just list off right now. <laughs> Same, same. I think the one that um, really got to me was kind of the um, holding space for folks' emotions and, excuse me, for their relationship to the behavior or the slip or the lapse, um, as Eve called it, and kind of finding the motion behind it. I think there's something really important in that. And kind of the pearl that Eve mentioned at the end where, you know, um, we have to learn what emotion folks are trying to avoid, how we can help them potentially uh, feel the emotion without using a substance, and how can we cope with those emotions? And I was like, man, that is psychology 101, and I'm here for it. I'm here to learn, relearn it, too. What about you, Carolyn? Absolutely. And I think as well, she points out, like, how, how can we 
help our patients be successful, which one involves us being sure that we're non-judgmental, that we're not using stigmatizing language, and that, you know, we're like managing our own emotions as well through this process. Yes. And yes. that it's really a crucial piece, you know, of this relationship if we're going to really try to help meet folks where they're at. Love it. Great. So let's, uh, let's kick it off. Get to it. Yeah. We are so excited to have you on the show today, and we really want our audience to get to know you a little bit better. So do you mind giving us a one-liner to describe yourself? Not at all. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to talk about a topic that I love and live for most of my waking life. Um, So I am a 33-year-old cisgender female. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I live and work in beautiful San Diego, California. Um, I have a dog called Twiggy. Um, I really enjoy um, terrible reality television and traveling the world with my partner. Oh my gosh, have- Eve. <laughs> go, go ahead, Carolyn. I, so I have to unpack. know, what's your favorite terrible reality show? That's what I was oh, the week, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this could be used for blackmail at some point, but I'm pretty vocal about this. Um, Vanderpump Rules is a show I have been following for far too long. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many scandals. Scandal, yeah. all, all of it. I feel like it's so I know. much. I know. I'm so glad that made it onto the podcast. Like we get to say the word scandal. <laughs> I know. Well, I will say I have trouble keeping up sometimes. I'm always like, yeah. wait, so who said what on what debrief? Like who's mad yep, at whom yep. right now? Just you ask know. me. I got it. Steel <laughs> trap. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, well, on the kind of uh, more potentially professional side, um, sure. Eve, would you mind sharing kind of what your favorite aspects of working in the field of addiction medicine or addiction um, in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so addiction encompasses so much, right? We talk about people's lives outside of the session that we see them in a lot in addiction. And I think that has always been a really attractive part of this work for me. I think also, you know, we meet people who are very much at a crossroads, right, in their life. They're deciding kind of what direction they want to take in a really big way. And so I just very much enjoy um, the privilege of sitting with people at that crossroads and trying to figure out, you know, which direction do you go? Where do your values lie? How can we help you get to the point where you want to be? I think it's, um, for me, it's deeply meaningful work. And I can't see myself doing anything else. Hmm. I love that framing of that values piece. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, what, what matters to you and how can we help you achieve that rather than trying to place our own values or other folks' values, you know, um, yeah. on the person that's sitting in front of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really cool work. The the values piece than anything acceptance and commitment therapy related. <laughs> I also love how you mentioned crossroads. Like, I think that's a super yeah. sneaky and sly transition for our topic. But also, I feel like <laughs> when we think about where, which way people are going, and you know, if they, especially if they have returned to use or kind of where their addiction journey is taking them, I think there's always kind of decisions, and people are at crossroads um, every day. Absolutely. You know. Mm-hmm. And with that era, do you want to take us to our first case from Cashlack Memorial? Yes, Carolyn, thanks. Um, so we are talking uh, with Jackie, but with Eve, but we're going to use Jackie as our case. Um, Jackie is seeing a patient, Miss B, who has been part of her continuity uh clinic patient panel since she started as an attending in a primary care clinic about six years ago. She knows Miss B very well, and recently they discussed the diagnosis of alcohol use disorder together. Miss B also has a history of cocaine use disorder that's in remission uh, basically for a decade or so, and she recently disclosed to Jackie, um, her primary care provider, that alcohol had taken over as kind of the um, substance of choice for her. Miss B is focused uh, on an abstinence approach. Uh, She says things like, I can't have any of that stuff. And she's looking to Jackie to help her with this goal. And so I might uh, ask Eve, you know, how can we help Jackie prepare herself for this encounter, this, you know, uh, point maybe of a crossroads that Miss B is coming to her in? Um, How would you advise Jackie uh, in preparing to see Miss B? 
Yeah, I think there are a few um, sort of different things that Jackie can be to be, Jackie can do rather to be well prepared for this. Um, I think that six years is a long time to know a particular patient. Probably a lot has happened in that interval. And so reviewing some of the kind of previous interactions that they've had, how she's talked about things like, you know, her cocaine use and what frame she uses for that is probably going to be helpful in opening this conversation. Um, she might want to think about Things like medication she can prescribe for craving based on the substance that you know she's coming in and saying she wants to stop. Um, definitely having a an understanding of the community mental health sort of options that are open to Miss B, given you know her insurance and maybe there are some even in clinic resources that she can use for therapy, psychotherapy. Um, things like you know what's available in the community in terms of self help groups and mutual aid groups and things like that. Um, and then, you know, kind of just relying probably quite a bit on the rapport that she's already got with her patient, having known her for so long. I think that's really going to help the interaction. And you said something interesting that I want to hear more about. You said yeah. reflecting on how she has sort of framed her use in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that or maybe some examples of common ways you see patients sort of frame their substance use? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a few different, I think, lenses through which our patients and we as providers can look at substance use disorders. So there's sort of your 12 step frame where, you know, the person identifies themselves as either an addict or an alcoholic. They work with other folks in that fellowship in order, you know, they might work steps, they might um, go to meetings, they might sponsor other people themselves, work with their own sponsor. And so that's going to be a particular set of vocabulary that patients use to, again, refer to themselves, refer to sort of the disease of alcoholism or addiction, right? And so mm -hmm. that particular nomenclature might feel really comfortable for a patient who works in that framework and not so much for a patient who doesn't view their substance use is something that is either on or off, right? Sometimes it's they're using a, you know, a harm reduction approach. They, you know, use occasionally and then just try to keep it within a certain range. And so different, I think, terminology might feel more comfortable for patients who are using that different frame. That's really helpful. And sort of on also to follow up with that on terminology. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I'm curious on your perspective in terms mm -hmm. of thinking about the term that I most commonly hear is someone had a relapse to a substance. Right. Um, right. I think more often in my practice, I'm using the term return to use. And I was mm -hmm. just curious on your thoughts and, and why one may prefer to use like one or the other in a clinical setting. Certainly. So um, I usually try and pick up on what a patient calls it. So if somebody comes in and says that they've had a relapse, that's how we sort of refer to that period of time, right? And if they, you know, maybe they say I messed up, I slipped up, I lapsed, that I would probably be more likely to go with that particular language. Um, so I really try and take the lead of the person that I'm working with. Um, but return to use covers it all, right? It's really sensitive language. It, it casts a wide net. And so that's probably appropriate if you don't know how your patient's going to refer to that behavior. Totally. I think in my notes in particular, I like to use return to use just because sure, it feels yeah. a little bit less like all or nothing. You know, it's more yes. of like a process and a journey. And mm -hmm. I also feel like that kind of harkens back to what you mentioned, Eve, about the lens or the framework. Kind of mm -hmm. we are operating within the way that the patient identifies, right? right? And the way that the patient kind of sees both the um, process of addiction and how their journey kind of goes through that and mm -hmm. whether they're, again, in the 12 state step framework and they identify themselves as X, Y, Z, you mentioned kind of like an addict or an alcoholic or there's something else and they kind of see themselves maybe using substances in a controlled way or maybe in a chaotic way and what does it mean to kind of describe that. I mm -hmm. wonder kind of, you know, going back to our case with Jackie, how would you suggest that Jackie introduce the concept even of return to use or, you know, if the patient has said I messed up or I had a lapse, you know, mm -hmm. how does, how can we advise Jackie when she's talking to Miss B about her goal of abstinence that maybe the reality is that she might have a return to use? Right. Yeah. I, I think it can be helpful to frame the conversation in terms of 
what we see in our practice. And very often people do return to use, right? It's, it's not a, um, it's not a hundred percent. We're sure it's going to happen for everybody, but it is something that happens. So if we can normalize that and just make it known that we know how difficult it is to have a relationship with substances that feels really congruent with, you know, your values, your hopes, your dreams all the time. Um, then I think that can, open the door and it creates less judgment on the part of the provider toward the patient. And so firstly, kind of normalizing the experience, um, maybe finding out a little bit of how it got to this point, right? So, you know, tell me from the beginning, how did this start? How did we get here? Um, what was going on at the time that you noticed that you were starting to drink more? Um, you know, you can bring in her successes, I think, too, with cocaine and talk about how she's been really successful with not using that, you know, since she stopped and how did she do that? So really drawing on strengths um, as well. I think those are some important places to start with her. And I wonder, Eve, if we can, we don't have to role play because I know that that's a aggressive curbsider <laughs> teach uh, component. But if we were to, you know, actually, let's say you were mm -hmm. Jackie in this scenario, can you maybe share some of the verbiage you might use? You know, I've heard people, I myself sometimes will talk about addiction mm -hmm. as a journey. And there's a lot of kind of forks and twists and turns and moments that we're expecting and unexpected or not expecting. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder you know, with you as our expert today, like what are the, what's the verbiage that you use that we can learn from? Finding out, I think the first thing that I'll try to do is find out what relationship the patient has to the behavior that's happened, right? So, so where are you at right now? How are you feeling about this? Right. And then kind of go from there. There could, you know, we might be sitting in front of someone who has this experience and it's, you know, they come in and like, oh, it was an amazing learning experience. I know what not to do now. And away we go. And some people might have, right, a significant amount of shame around it. So I think mm. really mirroring the affect of the person that we're working with. So if it's a very subdued and serious conversation, we can kind of go to that level with them um, and hold space for a, a very serious conversation. If it's a little bit more, okay, we need to plan, we need to do goals, we need to move forward, be proactive. Great. We jump into that mode. I don't think anything is necessarily, you know, um, I mean, there's some things that are probably taboo to <laughs> sort of do, but as long as you're taking cues from your patient, I think it it's probably going to proceed decently well. That's really helpful. And just sort of taking um, a step back, are there different like theories or framework that could be helpful to Jackie to understand, you know, the risk of return to use or to help um, the patient kind of like more deeply prepare for it? Yeah, I, I think that um, maybe talking about the situations in her life, again, we're looking at, you know, what's happening outside the, the, the appointment. So what situations in her life represent risky situations for her, ones mm -hmm. where she'll be either pressured to use or even offered um, a drink or a drug, something like that, um, can be really helpful in planning. So doing kind of the pre-planning work of it, maybe planning for if she finds herself in a situation where it's going to be hard to say no, um, what are her skills that she is going to use? So you can role play if she's into it. Um, you can do some kind of, all right, how would you refuse a drink, right? And it's your best friend who's asking and you've partied a lot recently and she's, you know, kind of begging you to do this with her and how do you refuse that, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, who do you call if you find yourself in the middle of kind of a drinking episode and you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Who do you call after the fact? Who do you call if you decide to leave the situation and you need to kind of emotionally come down from having to separate yourself from a risky situation, right? So mm -hmm. doing, I think, a lot of that, that pre-planning for situations is helpful. Um, if we want to talk about, you know, something like a cognitive behavioral therapy framework for this, Marlat talks about sort of this um, process of, of, you know, having a high risk situation, not coping effectively, and then kind of having a, a, 
a period of use. And then that, you know, that first use represents this abstinence violation, right? And so I've used once, I might as well keep using, it doesn't mm. matter now, let's go, right? And so maybe helping her to understand that that might happen for her, right? If she has one drink, it doesn't have to mean continued drinking. It can be a lapse or a slip or something that doesn't represent full on return to use, right? It can stay at that level if she copes effectively. And you can talk about what effective coping means for her too. And Eve, because some of us are really concrete, um, yes. exhibit A, I, <laughs> do you go through and you're like, Miss B, let's talk about the aspects of Marlatt's cognitive behavior theory. Or are you like, let's talk about, you know, playing the tape out, right? Like you don't, mm -hmm. you can have one drink and Right. You don't necessarily have to have 12 more because we know what happens when sometimes you have 12 more. Like, where is mm -hmm. the actual um, maybe application of the theory? Mm -hmm. Like, is it in that kind of strategy mitigation mm -hmm. or kind of like addressing those risky situations? Or how do you apply those frame that specific framework? Right. So I think the most compelling illustrations of these things are, are from the patient's own life. So I'd probably ask, you know, what was the last situation you were in where it was pretty risky? People were passing stuff around, the drinks were flowing, everybody's having a good time, and you felt tempted to drink or use, right? And then we talk about, okay, well, you know, that last time when you did have that first drink, how did it feel after that? Were you thinking anything about continuing to drink? Was it harder to not continue drinking, right, as the case may be for Ms. B? Um, and so kind of getting examples from their own experience and hopefully their more recent experience, it's a little bit more salient, um, to illustrate some of these points. And you, know, you don't necessarily have to say, you know, like one is too many and a million's not enough, right? That's You can use that to illustrate something like abstinence violation, for example. And I think in practice too, sometimes I have patients who say, I don't know what happened at all. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I had a slip up and I have no idea what happened. I don't know why I did it. I don't yeah. know how I ended up in that situation. And I find these mm -hmm. really challenging mm -hmm. um, to just help a, help discuss, you know, mm -hmm. do you have any tips or like probes that you kind of use to try and help a patient explore a little bit more if they're really not sure what kind of led to that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You kind of become um, a, de a detective of sorts, right? So you kind of go, all right, well, we know what day it happened. So what was going on, you know, the week before? Did you have any stressors that came into the picture? Were you worried about relationships, about money, about housing, about, you know, really and your job, right? What, what was on your mind? And do any of those things connect to your desire to relieve stress or to not think about those things, right? What would you have been wanting to avoid at the mm -hmm. point where you're deciding, do I drink or use or do I stay, you know, not drinking? And, and then you can kind of walk somebody through the rest of that process, you know, to the point where they have that first, you know, substance and then what happened after that, what happened? But you can kind of slow people down because they, they know the timeline, they lived it. So sometimes it's about getting that um, extra voice that's saying, okay, this shouldn't have happened. What Something has gone terribly wrong, right? And just letting them lay it out. Eve, that's super helpful. And I, I guess on the topic of slowing things down mm. and just, you know, because I'm a nerd alert that loves framework, sometimes, you know, for somebody like Miss B, who's focused on this kind of abstinence goal, mm -hmm. we talk about what you've mentioned, which is like situations, but also like people and places and things that might, you know, potentially mm -hmm. trigger a return to use. Sure. Do you have a, a framework that's similar to that, that when somebody has kind of a abstinence goal in mind mm -hmm. that you make sure maybe during a visit on return to use counseling that you kind of hit those major buckets? Um, we've already kind of talked about how do I separate myself in a risky situation, but do you also talk about like the person, places and things, or do you have like a different maybe catchy framework that you use to uh, make sure you discuss with patients. We love catchphrases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I wish I had something new to offer, but I think people, places and, and things really um, covers that because you want to hit on the supports and maybe the um, dangers to somebody's path forward. Right. So, I mean, and you can normalize too, that sometimes the people who represent the greatest risk are the people who are closest to us. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that doesn't mean that we have to cut ties with, you know, our spouse or our best friend or our sibling, right? It just means that, you know, maybe for the sake of, 
you living in line with what you value most, that relationship needs to change. Um, so just kind of not going in hard and fast with, okay, you can never go to this place again. You can never see this person again. You can't be around anything resembling alcohol. It's got to work in the context of a, like a real lived experience. And so that, that will probably mean talking about again, all of those areas. I'll try to think of a a new catchphrase now. I kind of want to brand my own. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. We need the Eve catchphrase. (laughs) This is really helpful. Just to summarize some of the things we've been talking mm-hmm. about. Um, I think one, I liked your idea of like, you're a detective, you know, you're going to help yeah. your patient uh, sort of walk through their steps in terms of what led to the return to use episode. And there are a number of things you can try. So one you said is um, exploring, you know, at risk situations in which mm-hmm. the individual like may feel pressured and sort of pre-planning almost for what they may do in like very specific scenarios Uh, Going back to the, again, if a person's not really sure, maybe what triggered it, again, Mm -hmm. more of that detective framework where you're going to go backwards and sort of try and connect maybe what happened in the prior week to what happened moving forward, as well as um, the people, places, and things, you know, sort of walking through those potential triggers that folks Mm -hmm. may have. And one thing I might add, Carolyn, to that is that I feel like Eve, you explored this thing, which I feel like I do in therapy, which I just want to reflect, which you said, like, what is the person's relationship to their behavior? So Mm -hmm. I feel like that is something that I don't often ask in my visits. Partially, Mm -hmm. it's because I'm a noob and, and, you know, the return to use counseling at time, but also because I think it's sometimes hard to hold space for that. And I, Mm -hmm. and, and folks maybe worry about like probing into the emotional connection, right? Are they, you know, you talked about mirroring the affect of the person or are they like, this was a learning experience or are they like, I'm actually holding a lot of shame because of that slip. Mm -hmm. So kind of, I find Mm -hmm. sometimes it's harder to know what to do in that moment, even Mm -hmm. though you want to, your intention is to hold space for that conversation and explore the relationship, but Mm -hmm. it's sometimes a little scary, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it feels really scary, too, when you think that you might hit on the reasons that somebody is using that are honestly not (laughs) terrible reasons, right? Substances cause problems because it feels good to ingest a substance that changes your frame of mind. And I Mm -hmm. think that sometimes we do need to acknowledge that, right? So what is it that's pulling you toward this thing? What is this thing giving you that life outside of, in this case, drinking and using, or maybe, you know, some other problematic behavior isn't giving you, right? What is the function? What are you trying to kind of feel or get or not feel? And if we address those things, then hopefully there's a different way to kind of manage that. And and maybe we drop the avoidance a little bit and, you know, approach some of the things that are really uncomfortable. But I, I think it's important to acknowledge that. People use for reasons, and those reasons are their reasons, so they're good reasons. I want to high five you, even though we're <laughs> hundreds of miles away. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. And when you're having these conversations, just in general, do you have mm-hmm. any tips to have a successful conversation with an individual, or are there certain pitfalls you think that like providers should try to avoid when they're having these conversations? Mm-hmm. Um, right. So. I think a stance of non-judgmentalness, openness, right? Really, I mean, if you need to manage your reaction to something that somebody is telling you, manage your reaction, right? We are there to support and prop up our patients. And so, you know, even if they're kind of using some self-shaming language, you don't have to do that. You can let them know that, yeah, I, I hear you. I feel you. I think you're being a bit hard on yourself. And let's kind of think about, you know, what else, what else we might do about this. Um, so again, just kind of being sure to not be the person in that patient's life who is shaming them about use. I mm-hmm. should go without saying, but there's still so much stigma around substance use disorders. And um, I, I just, PSA, off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> just want to make that that really clear. Um, I think also it can be so overwhelming at this crossroads point in somebody's journey um, to think about how life might look different. So slow the conversation down if you need to. I mean, you might feel tempted to throw a million resources at this person at once, mm. but that that nice little ask, tell, ask strategy I think works well here. Ask what they're already thinking about, give them some info, ask what they think about it, and just pace the conversation to them. 
um, I think those are super sort of helpful things. Eve, thank you for mentioning all those things. Also, just want to highlight the stigma piece. I think there is, you know, we've talked about this. I think there's a huge part of like fear. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for people to be uh, to approach a situation with stigma. Just like there's a lot of reasons for a patient to approach a situation with shame. Also, a lot of reasons for a person to approach approach a situation as a learning opportunity, right? Mm. And the minute we get a chance to slow the conversation down and kind of find those reasons too, I think is where mm-hmm. the change can happen or at least, at least maybe the acknowledgement of the state and then mm-hmm. moving towards progress can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of these kind of tips for success, you, you sure. hinted on some taboos and maybe <laughs> stigmatizing <laughs> language is some of that, yeah. but, but yeah. maybe are there other pitfalls that you want to make sure we and kind mm-hmm. of the listeners for us are, um, are trying to avoid? Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, requiring or suggesting that change has to happen all at once Mm -hmm. is pretty tough. Because, you know, again, people might be in a situation where every single person in their life is drinking and using, and it's just not tenable unless they're, you know, prepared to go to residential treatment, that they will be away from those people. And so we kind of have to build in some wiggle room, grace, whatever you want to call it, so that people can, you know, continue to live their life, make some, you know, appropriate changes, but do it at a pace where they don't feel completely overwhelmed and like they're being ripped from sometimes, you know, their primary coping strategy of substances. Totally. And that's a huge plug again to all of our listeners to remind them that this like this can be a harm reduction, right? Abstinence mm-hmm. doesn't Absolutely. have to be the goal. Really the goal mm-hmm. is to hopefully, hopefully reduce negative consequences. Um, mm-hmm. I think it mm-hmm. help people live happier and healthier lives based on their terms. But mm-hmm. I like that point that we can still use these techniques and doesn't have to be about abstinence. It can right. be about something else, you know, that, that aligns with the patient's values and goals. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And just to plug, um, because I don't know if Carolyn's going to do it, but there is a amazing addiction medicine um, episode uh, number eight, back to the basics, a stigma free history from the curbsiders addiction medicine yeah. season one. So just want to highlight that for listeners to really check out, listen to and everything that Eve is teaching us and reminding us about. I think there's um, really nice kind of comments around there and, and other juicy pearls to, to gain. I'm impressed. I almost forgot. I'm like, we, oh yeah, we did do a season one. We, we're so deep into season two. I'm like, oh yeah, we, we have, we have recorded other episodes. Okay. You know, um, I gotta plug your work. It's amazing. I think too, I'm curious in the era of COVID, a lot of us, I think have switched to mm-hmm. doing some virtual visits versus in person. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious if you feel like that change has affected your approach at all, or if you have any tips, I think particularly virtually, I find it a little bit more challenging to just like connect with the patient um, Mm -hmm. in front of a screen or on the telephone. And if you have any tips for us, that'd be great. Um, Yeah, I I think that there've been a lot of great things and a lot of difficult things (laughs) about moving primarily to telehealth. Um, I think that a huge plus is care gets to people who might not be able to, you know, come in and see us in the office. And this can be a benefit with kind of substance use issues. If somebody has been drinking heavily the night before, and they don't feel super confident in driving, they can still meet with you that day. And they're sobering up and they're getting to a place where you can still kind of talk with them and have a, you know, productive session, but they don't run that risk right, of legal consequences if they try and see you in person. So I I think that there's some really great things about it. I also have had, so I was working on um, nicotine use with a patient of mine and he had a ton of these like vapes, right, the little handheld ones around his room. And so we got to talking during the session and at a certain point he was like, you know what, I'm just going to throw them out. And so he had a chance when he was feeling super motivated to gather all these vapes up. And I walked with him on camera over to the dumpster or whatever. He threw them in and they were wow. gone. Right. And so we got to do some, you know, in vivo stuff because we were on telehealth. Um, so I, I think that that can be really great. Um, a huge benefit. Um, you also get, you know, a sense, I think, of a patient that's quite a bit deeper, right? You know, we get to see other parts of their lives that we we don't see when they come to us. Um, In terms of things making it more difficult, I think for, you know, substance use in particular, sometimes we do rely on breathalyzers, urine screens, things like that, in order to make sure we're giving the best care that we possibly can. And, you know, COVID made that significantly more difficult. And so there was a lot of, um, 
I don't know, there was just a lack of access to that particular resource for us as providers. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I think that <laughs> telehealth has gone about as well as can be expected, given the conditions of the past few years. Um, I don't know if there are any other kind of, you know, components that you've noticed in your work with people with substance use issues, but I'm, I'm kind of curious, honestly. I feel like sometimes for me, um, we do have a lot of video visits and actually my kind of primary care addiction medicine clinic, there's probably, it's probably 50, 50 kind of video and in person. And sometimes I find myself being like, this was a 20 minute visit. We are interestingly still on video at minute 42, you know, like, oh. we, are, <laughs> like we are still going. And yeah. I find myself with like the feelings of I am, there's so much richness here and so much mm. incredible kind of a relationship building and what I'm learning about this person and how invested they are and their motivations and everything that it's like sometimes often harder I think to like end visits on zoom because you're like yeah. I'm gonna I have to put you back in the waiting room now <laughs> you know <Right. laughs> or like right. I have to remove you from zoom and unclick the box that says <laughs> report to zoom because I don't want to report you to zoom I just want you to like <laughs> exit you know so right. I find myself being like what can I do which actually mm -hmm. potentially transitions us to the next question which sure. I wonder Eve in terms of um you know advising Jackie and helping her in let's say her 15 minute visits that she has sure. in primary care. Um, we talked about a lot of strategies already. We talked about normalizing. We talked about holding space for uh, kind of the relationship to the behavior or the slip and the emotion behind it. We talked about addressing people, places, and things and kind of mm -hmm. risky situations. Are there other strategies we haven't mentioned that are maybe helpful in that kind of time limited visit um, mm -hmm. when we try to talk to Miss B about her goal around not using alcohol? Mm -hmm. I'm always very interested in a person's support system, right? So who is it that's got your back in, you know, reaching this goal and maintaining success with it? So, you know, thinking about, you know, who are you going to talk to about this visit today? Who needs to, needs the debrief about, you know, what's going to be helpful for you? Um, that can be really helpful. I think hitting on, you know, just the the main points would probably be how are you successful in leaving this visit? What does that mean in terms of just like we've talked about before, you know, where you go, who you see, what you do. Um, what are your strategies for staying safe in those situations? Who do you call if things don't go well? Um, and do, does life need to look a little bit different today so that mm -hmm. it can get back to a place that feels a little bit more kind of normal for you in the future? Right. Do you need to decline that invitation to your aunt's 50th birthday party because your family drinks a lot and it's going to be hard to be around them? Right. So just kind of, you know, what's coming up in the near future, I think, is really helpful. It gives people kind of a, a frame where they're like looking at these situations. They're really salient because they're about to happen in real time and they've got a plan going in. I think, you know, increasing self-efficacy is something that, you know, ideally we're able to help our patients do. And so any way that we can do a little pre-planning, do a little bit of, you know, how do we maintain this goal? How do we get you closer to your goal long term? Uh, who supports you? Mic drop, Eve. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. It's attached. I can't drop it. <laughs> oh, nice. Ooh, that was a good podcast joke. Yes. I love Thanks. it. <laughs> do you think, Eve, does this, do these goals or these strategies change mm -hmm. if the goals are different? Like if Miss B yeah. was saying, you know, actually, I just want to drink a little bit less. I don't really want to yeah. um, pursue abstinence. That's not my goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're still going to need to identify situations where she's tempted to drink more than what she wants to drink. Um, she's going to need people probably who have her back and are supporting her and decreasing the amount of drinking that she's doing. Um, I don't know. She might need any number of supports. I mean, even medication wise, there are medications that help suppress cravings and help to feel more satiated once you start drinking. And so those might be part of her plan if she's focused on harm reduction and if she's focused on total abstinence. So a lot, there's a lot of crossover there. Well, Eve, thank you so much for talking about those strategies for Jackie. I wonder, you mentioned this a little bit earlier. Could you kind of give us a sense of how um, mutual aid or mutual support groups um, mm -hmm. kind of fit into this conversation, especially if Jackie only has 15 minutes to talk about um, kind of return to use prevention and counseling? How do how should clinicians kind of introduce this? And maybe is there even evidence behind it to do that? Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. So there's a lot of evidence that mutual aid groups and participation in them can increase the time from, you know, stopping use to a return to use or a slip or any kind of use. Um, so we definitely want to make sure patients are aware of the options available to them. And there are quite a few. So there's the tried and true Alcoholics Anonymous been around since the 1930s. These are groups of people who identify themselves as alcoholics or addicts who get together and discuss, you know, substance related and spiritual topics. Um, so these are around kind of the 12 steps popularized in a lot of media these days to greater or lesser accuracy. And so those groups kind of people are meeting and just sharing their experience, strength and hope is the idea behind those to help each other remain sober, right? And this is all using the nomenclature, nomenclature of the 12 step kind of world. So those are available. They're widely available. Every kind of um, section of the country, it's almost like counties, um, has their own sort of organization that runs or they don't run the meetings in that area, but they sort of keep the information in one place <laughs> on those meetings. So it's easy to find meetings near you if that's something that you know you want to explore. Same goes for, um, there's a kind of a 12-step organization called Narcotics Anonymous. It's the same framework, but it's folks who identify as addicts and maybe use drugs instead of alcohol or drugs are their primary issue um, instead of alcohol. So that's, again, the old school, been around forever, widely known um, kind of fellowship to maybe introduce patients to. And um, there are also other kind of places to go. So smart recovery is really popular in Southern California. I know it's got other pockets of the country where there are a lot of meetings. It is um, more like it's kind of like cognitive behavioral therapy for mm -hmm. the folks that go. There's usually a trained facilitator in those meetings and somebody who's kind of guiding the conversation on a particular topic. And then the people who come to the meeting will share their experience with that. Sometimes, um, you know, they'll celebrate periods of sobriety or talk about periods of sobriety, um, but there's no real sponsorship set up there. So in Alcoholics Anonymous, you kind of identify somebody who you want to work the 12 steps with and they guide you through, right? So smart recovery, not so much. Um, so that's kind of the maybe second most popular, sorry, <laughs> fellowship that is out there. Um, there's also things like, you know, moderation management, um, less meetings available, but the focus there is on moderating use instead of stopping use. So if somebody doesn't want to be completely abstinent, that might be a place for them to go to. Same kind of thing. It's just a meeting where people get together and talk about why their goal is what their goal happens to be and how they can support each other in achieving that. Um, you're kind of, you know, other organizations, there's something called Life Ring out here, secular organizations for sobriety, things that don't have, you know, a spiritual or what can sometimes read as a religious component with the 12 step way of doing things, because the word God is included in that. It means something different to every single person who you know works a program of AA. However, for some people, that's just not something that they want with their recovery. So there are a lot of other options on top of, on top of that. Do you have a spiel you give to a patient? Because I've heard many patients yeah. say I went to a meeting once and it wasn't for me. I'll never go back. Mm -hmm. How do you sort of talk to patients about this or encourage maybe to try a different type of group. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the, the thing about AA meetings, and this is what I will tell patients. So AA is usually the one that comes up where I didn't really like it. I don't want to go back because people have usually tried that one out. Um, I will let them know that if you've been to one AA meeting, you've been to one AA meeting. There are so many different formats. There are different people who show up at each meeting. There are meetings, you know, for women only, men only, young people, LGBTQIA plus folks, right? There, There's as many different kinds of meetings as you could probably possibly imagine. And so mm -hmm. I would potentially encourage that person to try a couple more, see if they dislike them as much as they dislike that first one and what that might mean for kind of expanding their, their kind of view on it. Same, same goes for SMART. SMART can have a you know, there's meetings where people just go and share. It's like a discussion meeting. And there are meetings where people will um, talk about a particular um, tool, right? A smart recovery tool. 
So sometimes things like behavior chain analysis or some such kind of kind of strategy. So, you know, encourage people to try different days of the week, different topics, different kinds of meetings, all of that, um, just so they get a real feel for what's out there. And Eve, this is a little bit in the weeds, but how would you define the like 12 step Mm -hmm. groups, 12 step facilitation, and then Mm -hmm. kind of mutual help groups? Like, are they all Mm -hmm. Venn diagrams? Are they all the same? Does facilitation kind of lead to the 12 step groups? Maybe how do you think about it or explain it to uh, learners maybe? Yes. Yeah. So 12 step facilitation is a manualized protocol. And basically you're working the first few steps of AA in like a therapy setting. You can do a group therapy, individual therapy. And basically, just as you said, you're setting somebody up to continue working those steps out in the wild in AA with a sponsor, right? Um, 12 step groups are there for people to kind of come together and talk about their experiences with sobriety. And from that, you know, you kind of, the, the idea is to get a sponsor of your own who's worked these steps, work those steps with them. So either pathway is great. Um, AA and kind of finding a group and a sponsor in the wild is a little bit easier to do than finding a specific 12-step facilitation group where you can mm-hmm. get in with a therapist trained to do that and things like that. So um, it's just kind of all roads lead. That's really helpful. I feel like there's so many terminology and groups available for people, it's important to know that they're not all the same and it's quite confusing and it's not one size sort of fits all. And I think too, like going a little bit back to our case uh, with Jackie. So, you know, you spent maybe the first part of your visit really talking with her around her goals surrounding her alcohol use, but she also does have this history of cocaine use disorder and it's pretty remote and she's been doing really well for a long time. But how does your conversations, how does your conversation sort of change Um, if someone is really in sustained remission in terms of how do we help them continue to be successful in sustained remission? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So because there is a history, it is remote, but there is a history there. I would be curious to know if Jack or if Ms. B's alcohol use has increased her kind of desire to return to cocaine use. Mm. We don't know how closely those two things were intertwined when she was using cocaine. And so maybe something about alcohol has sparked a desire for that same feeling she got from cocaine. Who knows? So we just want to kind of talk about that. Because she's had such success with abstaining from cocaine and and really meeting that goal of hers, there's probably a lot there that we can mine for, okay, what made you successful? How can we apply that to this substance? So we can kind of, you know, be looking to capitalize on that success by drawing it into the present for her. Um, And and again, just kind of build on those strategies and try and help facilitate her using those skills. And maybe even some of the connections she made when she was first, you know, stopping cocaine use, maybe some of the people that were supporting her then would be supportive now and would, you know, be able to give her that perspective too. of Okay, you did it this time, you can do it again. And Eve, this might be a basic question, Mm -hmm. but do you feel that your strategies that you use change based on what substance someone is using or change based on, again, like how long they've been using or even how long Mm -hmm. they've not been using? Um, Mm -hmm. Do you find that you kind of lean towards one approach, uh, maybe the at-risk situations, kind of what do you do and how do you plan for emergencies versus maybe less so on the people, places, and things? Does that influence kind of how you decide? I think it it can. It certainly can. I think about one example is that um, there's a strong connection between methamphetamine use and sex, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a behavior that they might not want to abstain from of sex and a behavior that they might want to abstain from, which is meth. And it's going to be a lot of kind of relearning what sex looks like without that drug as part of the mix. And so that's an example where the focus is going to be a little bit different because there's something that, again, we want to sustain, which is sex and intimacy and things like that. But we might want it to look different. And, you know, the patient wants it to look different, too, if they're coming for sort of help with this. So that's one case where, again, that focus might be a little bit different. We might be tuned into um, different risky situations different, um, you know, kinds of relationships with people. Um, but I mean, a lot of the same strategies are, are going to apply. It's going to be about 
you know, trying to determine, you know, is there an emotion that you're trying to avoid by using this thing? Is that emotion, you know, life threatening? How can we help you to feel that emotion without using the thing that dampens the emotion? And from that, can you cope in different ways? Right? So I think the same basic principles apply. And there's a lot of similar elements that we focus on. There might just be, you know, tweaks, right, to how, how we do that. My mind is exploding. I don't know about you, Carolyn. I feel like I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> totally. I can't type my notes fast enough. Um, <laughs> everything you were saying. Um, maybe we transition to take home points. What do you think, Carolyn? I think yeah. so. I mean, there's so much we have covered today. I'm really mm-hmm. excited to like try some things, some of these things out in clinic. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. what do you want your listeners to know? What are your, what are your big take homes? Yeah. Um, so conversations around problematic substance use whatever the level of use that your patient is coming to you with are vital for effective patient care. So these are not conversations that, and I think we know this by now, but just to really hammer home the point, these are conversations that we need to have that are vital for helping our patients to live the lives that they want to live. And so the more we can do to normalize that they're difficult to have, but very important to have as well. Um, I think then we can sort of set the tone with our patients for these conversations. Um, the other piece is just to offer compassion. I mean, if somebody is coming to you with a problem like this and they are asking for you to help them solve it or make it better, I mean, that is a gigantic honor. And there's probably a lot of, they probably feel a lot of things about the behavior that they've engaged in. And the way that, you know, their relationship with this substance is not what they thought that it would be, right? Mm-hmm. And so compassion, support, non-judgmentalness, all of those things that we would offer to our patients anyway, become very important in this sort of situation, given the attitudes that are out there about things like addiction. And Eve, anything on, in, with that in mind, anything that you want to plug? And it could be, you know, resources where clinicians can uh, get more information mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. return to use prevention and counseling, uh, maybe mm-hmm. things that help you stay so up to date and our expert, um, anything that you'd like to plug. Or anything yeah. that you just love. Yeah. So yeah, that works too. <laughs> All the things. Yeah. So there are a lot of fantastic resources out there. SAMHSA has a beautiful library, a lot of it available online. So if you want to kind of poke around at what's available and the frameworks that you can use in order to um, kind of, you know, bring your practice forward with addiction medicine and especially with counseling, that that can be a super helpful resource. Um, Trauma-informed care, anything that is sort of the intersection of trauma and substance use disorders is my favorite thing in the world. So if you have the opportunity to take um, even, you know, basic level training on how psychological trauma factors into substance use, definitely do that. I find that most of the patients I see have had some kind of, you know, sexual, interpersonal, physical violence-based trauma. And so, you know, being able to have those conversations as well and refer to appropriate treatment for those becomes very, very important. So those are my plugs. That was amazing. I also have been thinking about and brainstorming like mm. how we can use your name in a catchphrase um, <laughs> and <laughs> in a framework. And I don't know if either of you Peloton, but there's a Peloton uh, instructor named, uh, uh, I'm going to mess it up, but it's Emma Lovewell. And she says like, live, okay. love, live, laugh, love well or something. But I feel like <laughs> maybe yours Eve could be like, live, love, last well, or like live, <laughs> love, <laughs> use well. I don't know, like kind of in the substance use. I was really trying to brain fr- brainstorm, but I feel like I've just had brain farts the whole time. So I don't yeah, know yeah. if anything I love that. came out for you. I'm going to get it there. Yes, I, I'm going to get a sign of that printed and put on my wall in my living room. That that feels appropriate. <laughs> yeah, if there's a package from San Francisco, it's me being like, here it is, Eve. We, we, we printed hilarious. it. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> put this up nowhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Of course. Thank you for having me. This I my favorite topic in the world, and I'm so glad to get to have a conversation about it with two such warm and welcoming people. Thank you all so much for having me. 
This has been another episode of our Curbsiders mini series, The Curbsiders Addiction Medicine. Be sure to get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com slash addiction. And we're absolutely committed to bringing you high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or contact us at curbsidersaddictionmed at gmail.com. And a very special thanks, you know, to Dr. Matt Watto and Dr. Paul Williams for their support in this project, as well as ACAM, the American College of Academic Addiction Medicine. Learn more about their organization at ACAM.org. And as always, it takes a huge team to put this series together. So a special thanks to everyone on our team, as well as our editor for this episode, Kento Sonoda. The Curbsiders is produced and edited by the Podpace team. And until next time, I've been Dr. Kira Lynchian. And a reminder that this and most episodes are available for free CME credit for all healthcare professionals at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. All you have to do is create an account. And I'm Dr. Ira Krasnovska. Thank you for joining us today. And let us bring you a little nugget of addiction medicine pearls. <laughs> mm.